Well, hello. This is Jeff with Final Boss. We're doing something a little, <coughs> excuse me, different tonight because of your special request. So, in the wake of this um, uh, kind of terrible coronavirus, uh, and, and uh, the fact that many of us are relegated inside, I thought I would take some requests on what you guys wanted me to do a stream about uh, in terms of literature. And one of the things that you requested was for me to analyze a published work, something that had some like really interesting properties, interesting things to learn and pick out, and to share that. Uh, with you guys and to do kind of a more literary analysis that we can all talk through together. So this is a short story called The Year of Silence. Um, I'm debating whether I should read it all really quickly and then go through in more detail. Um, and then discuss it afterwards. I right click to grab, right? Good old Adobe Reader. It's terribleness. Ah, that's what I want. This. All right. Um. So. Hmm. Hello, boss. How are you? I'm doing very well, Trip the Wolf. Welcome, welcome. Uh, looking forward to be doing this kind of like reading uh together with you guys. So very excited. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and start in on the story, and if we stop and talk about stuff, we stop and talk about stuff, and if not, we'll figure it out. So shortly after two in the afternoon on Monday, the 6th of April, a few seconds of silence overtook the city. The rattle of the jackhammers, the boom of the transformers, and the whir of the ventilation fans all came to a halt. Suddenly there were no car alarms cutting through the air, no trains scraping over the rails, no steam pipes exhaling their fumes, no peddlers shouting into the streets. Even the wind seemed to hesitate. We waited for the incident to pass, and when it did, we went about our business. None of us foresaw the repercussions. Okay, so what's happening in this first section, which is really interesting, uh, is first it's establishing um, this mystery, the sense of an event. And the way they're doing that, uh, a lot of it is through this very, very specific sense of time. Um, so this, you know. Uh, and I'll just put this in PvP1. Uh, I'll just go ahead and take notes and, and give you guys some, some tips and maybe some stuff that maybe they didn't do perfectly. But um, they make, um, the writer makes a sense of reported event by a very explicit use of time. Where they're saying at this time, uh, of time, you know, you know, April X. They're using extremely concrete details, you know. And it's all related to sound. So this is the year of silence, and what are the things that suddenly vanish? The rattle of jackhammers, the boom of transformers, the whir of ventilation fans all came up to a halt. And then this is the power of lists. Um, plural POV, that's what I did. Yes, that's wonderful. So this is, we are talking about uh, a plural POV story uh, for a number of reasons. One, this story just uses a lot of really great technique in general. And then two, plural POV is something I, I don't think a lot of a lot of new writers read a lot about. And it's not something you're ever going to use regularly, but it is a really interesting tool in, in your tool belt to use something like a plural POV, especially in short fiction, because, you know, it's hard to sustain it over a whole novel, maybe in like a chapter or a section of a novel. Um, but plural POV is really a cool tool, and I think um, one that is underutilized, because it, it just has a really cool uh, vibe to it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so then we're suddenly getting this onslaught of noise, you know, the rattle of jackhammers, the boom, da 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 and then it introduces the POV, and so that we don't, no one was really, the, like, there is kind of a generalized narrator, but it doesn't really get specific until we get this. 
and we don't get a Wii until until after that kind of introduction of this wall of sound, the sense of an event, and then it gives us the narrator. So it's a very, very measured and careful intro to the story. And this one, this story, it's going to be tough to find things about that that we could say, oh, hey, maybe we could improve this, maybe this didn't work. Uh, this is a really well written story in my point of view. But we'll see some of the disadvantages of the plural POV and maybe how the writer has to adapt to those. And I think they really do. Uh, there's certain times in the story where they're going to the, the writer really does have to change gears and, and to make the plural POV work. So they're using these very, very narrow sections. Two, three. So very, very tight sectioning uh, in this. And... Anyways, I'll kind of go into more detail later. Um, but yeah, anyways, the city's whole immense carousel of sound should stop. That that the city's whole immense carousel of sound should stop at one and the same moment was unusual. Of course, not exactly inexplicable. Ex inexplicable. We had witnessed the same phenomenon on a lesser scale at various cocktail parties and interoffice minglers over the years, when the pauses and conversations overlapped to produce an air pocket of total silence, making us all feel as if we've been caught eavesdropping on one another. So again, we're we're getting the making us all feel. So one thing that I think is thoughtful about the plural POV that they're doing is they're making it very personal. Um, you know, uh, you know, if you're, it really is coming from an individual. You can get this individual's voice making us all feel like we were eavesdropping on each other. So that that is. The way they're executing the plural point of view is that they're having one person voice, one's person's tone, one person's method of speaking represent the plural and to kind of summarize all this stuff. So, it, you know, because this is like, you know, um, we had we had witnessed the same phenomenon in lesser parties. Like, it's almost like a royal we where there's one person speaking on behalf. Uh, and that's kind of the where the narrator comes in that never really nails down who this is. Um, but it's an interesting, interesting technique. And I think this is a cool technique. Oh, I should have done that David Foster Wallace story. That's also really good. In the in the second person. Uh, anyways, maybe next time. Maybe next time I do one of these things. Which is, they may not be too common because I know there's a long line. Um, there's a long line of folks waiting for <clears throat> waiting for edits, and I kind of feel guilty uh, editing a already published story in some ways. Um, but yeah. Uh, but if everyone wants this, this is what we can talk about. So if you're doing a pro POV, having a voice to the narrator. Is still necessary. And what does a voice mean? It means just a manner of speaking. A voice is a colloquial, you know, is a set of you know tone and you know style. And so I think a lot of writers get caught up in voice uh, and they get kind of worried about it. But a lot of it can be like you know s part of the voice is you know back in my day. There were no youngins like you running around. That's voice, right? Like, that's a certain type of voice. That's a certain tone of voice. <clears throat> Anyone want for free sample? <laughs> yeah, there's some funny folks out there. Welcome, Miyak. We're doing an edit on an already published work tonight, so this should be kind of fun. Um, and you don't have to deal with all the uh, it, and it's uh, you don't have to deal with the weird stuff. Uh, a handful of people were ch changed by the episode; their lives redirected in large ways or small ones. The editor of a gossip magazine. So this is probably the first place where I would say, uh, like, one thing that it's a bit of a clunky transition, and I can kind of see why they have to do that. And and there's enough good where you kind of get over it. But I feel like this transition into the meaning of it goes pretty like. It's a bit of a speed bump, and they they get away with it by having you know this little thing here, um, but you know the I would say page one. No, this is page one. How am I doing? P one, two, three. Page one, page one. Um. So I think the, the the reason this feels a little clunky is that they've been using so much tactile detail, and then all of a sudden we jump right into summary. And I don't think that's necessarily bad. Um, I think you actually need summary here. You need something, but it feels like too sharp of a zoom out. I wonder if they could have been, you know, 
we whispered amongst ourselves, you know, these types of things to kind of ease us into the summary. Um, so that's actually a point where I would say, eh, you know, that there maybe is a little bit of smoothing that could have been done. Their lives are redirected in large ways. Yeah, because then we say, true, no one could remember such a thing happening in the entire city before, but it was not so hard to believe that it would. A handful of people were changed by the episode. So it kind of like feels a little abrupt, but that's okay. Their lives are redirected in large ways or small ones. The editor of a gossip magazine, for instance, came out of the silence determined to substitute next issue's lead article about a movie star for one about a fashion model, while her assistant realized that the time had come for her to resign her job and apply for her teaching license. Um, <clears throat> a lifelong vegetarian who was dining in a restaurant outside in the art museum. So then he's jumping right back to the details. So yeah, I... I, I like, you know, I like that we're back in the details. Uh, we're back in the details, but the balance between summary and scene and detailed examples. Yeah, I would say that the transitioning between the really, really sharp, vivid details and the, ab like, you know, kind of like the pulled back summary is a little rough in, the, in this particular section. Um, a lifelong vegetarian who was dining in the restaurant outside the art museum decided to order a porterhouse steak cooked medium rare. A would-be suicide had just finished finished filling his water glass in the faucet in his bathroom when everything around him seemed to stop moving and the silence passed through him like a wave, bringing with it a sense of peace and clarity he had forgotten. He was capable of feeling. He put the pill bottle back in his medicine cabinet. Such people were the exceptions, though. Most of us went on with our lives as though nothing of any importance had happened until the next incident occurred four days later. So we're already getting a sense of build, which I think is really, really good. I mean, you think about this, we're only maybe 500 or so words. Um, it's going to be very ugly. Um, but we're only 500 or so words in, and we're already getting a sense of build, which I think is really, really good. We have event, escalation, further escalation, and how it's affecting characters very, very quickly. Um, so, you know, we're only a few hundred words in, and the author... Is already, you know, ratcheting. Building the, you know, momentum. I think that's something to, to, to take, it, you know, uh, advice on. You know, is to say, hey, you know, the sooner we can get to the action, the sooner we can move the momentum forward, the better. There's, there's a, a lot of stories, a lot of fluff at the beginning, a lot of setup that I don't think... Even in my stories, and you, you can probably, you know, say this when I'm writing them, is that it just it has a little too much time on setup. And here we are, you know, a couple hundred words in, and we're, we're moving well out of setup. Oops. This time the silence lasted nearly six seconds. Ten million sounds broke off and recommended and recommenced like an, in, like an old engine marking on a pause and catching spark again. Those of us who had forgotten the first episode now remembered it. Were the two occasions connected, we wondered? If so, how? Was it this force that could quell all the tumult and noise of the city, and not just the clicking of the subway turnstiles and the snap of the grocery store awnings, but even the sound of street traffic, that oceanic rumble that for more than a century seemed as indeterminate, interminable to us as the motion of the sun across the sky? Where had it come from? All right, so look at this. I mean, and this is something to think about when you're constructing paragraphs, is this is one massive sentence. And what he's doing is he's drawing out this list. This is one humongous sentence. You know, was it? What was it? So we get the core base clause right there. And this is going to really go into like sentence level details. Because that's the great thing about published work, especially good published work. Um, you can analyze on a lot of different levels, which is a lot of fun. So the base clause of the sentence, what was it? That's it. So we get it. So then he's drawing out the thought, right? So the reason you put the base clause first is it can kind of give a sense of brainstorming and variance. So we already like, okay, we have this question set, and then the sentence varies out through all the different 
options. What was it, this force that could quell all the tumult and noise of the city? And not just the clicking of the subway tiles and the snap of the grocery store awnings, but even the sound of the traffic, that oceanic rumble that for more than a century had seemed as interminable to us as the motion of the sun across the sky. So it's like pulling out this wondering. So it's, well, that, the reason that sentence matters and the reason they have that base clause there that extends out far into a bunch of, you know, additional clauses that are coming on, dependent, dependent clauses that are coming onto it, is because it will make our wonder extend. So when they establish that question and they draw out the sentence and make a long sentence, which is not always easy to pull off, but sometimes very valuable in fiction, um, then that makes us, you know, spend extra time wondering and and, and then they end on this amazing image. I think that's like a, a crazy good image. Um, where had it come from? And then, boom, short sentences, right again. So this is another good thing. This is like, you know, we have... We have, um, we use, and if you want to learn about this sentence structure stuff, we have that um, style guide. Um, I can pull it up for you guys. I think it's just um, exclamation point style. Once my chatbot loads, I forgot to turn it on. Shame on me. Um, but yeah, but that, that that's, and then we're right back to short sense. So we have, you know, have variance sentence structure, you know. One really long sentence, pulling a question out, and followed by two quick. So there you go. So there's a style glossary right there. Um, if you're, you know, watching the VOD later or something, um, hopefully that will help. All right, these questions nettled us. We could see them shining out of one another's eyes, but a few days passed before we began to give voice to them. The silence was unusual, and we were not entirely sure how to talk about it, not because it was too grave and not because it was too trivial, but because it seemed grave one moment and trivial the next. Excuse me. I'll add a pizza. One moment. I'll be right back. All right. Oops. Okay. So, very descent structure. These questions are lost. And then we get interiority. So we're getting all these scene moments, right? So we get 10 million sounds. So we get this very concrete detail, and then we get the internalization. Um, so this is this is good. Um, so you know you have kind of the concrete details. I wish I could change the color on this highlighter. Um, oh my goodness gracious. Um, whatever, it's going to be annoying. Uh, but you get the concrete detail and then you get the internalization here. Um, which is really, really cool. Um, and that's a good way of thinking about it. You have kind of the stimulus response when you think about, hey, how do I get into characters' minds? Even how do I get into a plural point of view characters' minds? It's very, very similar techniques. Uh, I don't believe, or maybe not. I don't think so. Unless we washed them, but I don't think so. Um, how do I get into a character's mind? You know, you can kind of launch in from the scene. So you give the concrete examples then jump in in more detail. Okay. <clears throat> so, a stand-up comedian performing on one of the late night talk shows was one of the first was the first of us to broach the subject, albeit indirectly. 
He waited for a moment in his act when the audience had fallen completely still and halted mid-sentence, raising one of his index fingers in listening gesture. A smile edged its way under his lips. He gave the pause, perhaps one second too long, just enough for a trace of self-amusement to show on his face, then continue with the joke he'd been telling. He could not have anticipated the size of the laugh he could receive. So a really good way of showing, you know, the tension. You know, he got a huge laugh out of it, right? Um, I'll do page three here. Um, so, like, using examples. And this is tough, because this is not your typical novel-style story. This is a narrator, a plural narrator, sure, but a narrator telling a story. A narrator taking a bunch of events, redacting them into something that 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 encum that's encapsulated right so i think there's always a little bit of tricky stuff working with stuff like this when there is a really present narrator and that narrator is taking a lot of different different things and kind of smoothing them over meshing them massaging them but this is a, a good way of managing that making it still feel like a scene like you know when you're giving your massive you know uh, the the example of, of this is when you're giving your massive um you know, world building type things, <laughs> you know, obviously you generally don't want to do that, but if you do need to tell something about the past, using these really specific concrete examples can be a really great launching point into just showing and saying, okay, I need to get across the idea that everyone's kind of tense and nervous about this. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to have a stand-up comedian broach the subject and, and everyone's going to kind of blow off some steam and get a big laugh. So this is like a retrospective narrator, right? Uh, and that's the trick, is like how do you make a retrospective narrator, or a narrator that's looking back, um, feel like, you know, there's something really going on here. And I think this is one of the good techniques to do, uh, is to say, okay, there was a stand-up comedian, the moment in his act, and just like zoom into this moment, and then boom, we're right onto episode six, you know, we're, we, we've moved on. The next morning's newspapers had already been put to bed by the time the comedian's routine was broadcast. The morning after that, though, the first few editorials about the silence appeared. Then the radio hosts and TV commentators began to talk about it, and soon enough it was the city's chief topic of conversation. Every family dinner built around, bent around it. Sooner or later, every business hunch, lunch, every pillow talk, the bars and health clubs all circulated with beds about the phenomenon, bets about the phenomenon. $10 says the government had something to do with it. 20 says it'll never happen again. When two full weeks went by without another incident, our interest in the matter threatened to shrivel away. It might have actually done so had the next episode not occurred the following Sunday, surprising us all in the middle of our church services. There was another silence, more than ten seconds long, just a couple of days later, and a much shorter silence, like a hiccup, the day after that. Every time one of the silences came to an end, we felt as though we had passed through a long, transparent passageway, a tunnel of sorts, one that made the world into which we emerged appear brighter and cleaner than it had before, less troubled, more humane. The silence siphoned out of the city and into our ears, spilling from there into our dreams and beliefs, our memories and expectations. In the wake of each first fresh episode, a new feeling flowed through us, full of warmth and a lazy equanimity. It took us a while to recognize the feeling for what it was, contentment. Uh, okay, so another pretty complex construction in this paragraph to get to this payoff at the end. Um, so we can kind of look. Every time we felt as though it passed through a long passageway, a tunnel of sorts, one that made the word. So a really, really long sentence. This is all one sentence. The silence siphoned into the city to our ears, spilling. Da, 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 da. So another pretty long sentence in the wake of the fresh episode, and then they start getting shorter. So there's kind of an acceleration here. It took us a while, and then contentment kind of sets itself off. This is an interesting construction of this paragraph. So you start with these big sentences, and you're building. And this is uh, what a lot of them, a lot of writers will call perigraphy, if I can pronounce that right. Perigraphy is just how you structure your paragraphs, how you cut between your paragraphs. Uh, and so we can see here is that there, these sentences in this paragraph are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Start really long and, and zoom in, and then they end on this one word 
uh, and that semicolon is a really is a really hard stop. It, it does almost feel like a period. So it's almost setting that word out. It's boiling all this stuff down to that word contentment. So this is a really interesting technique. So let's just read this again slowly. <clears throat> Every time one of the silences came to an end, we felt that we had passed through a long transparent passageway, a tunnel. So again, making it a list, adding another you know prepositional phrase, a tunnel of sorts, another comma. One that made the world into which we appeared appear brighter and cleaner than it had before. Another comma. Less troubled. So it's just zooming in tighter and tighter and making this thing, uh, the sentence longer and longer. Less troubled. More humane. The silence siphoned out of the city. And then we, we period. Let more humane. The silence siphoned out of the city and into our ears. Another comma. Stretching that out. Spilling from there into our dreams and beliefs. Comma. Our memories and expectations. So it's also getting more abstract. So it's come from something you know, really concrete, which is like, you know, something interrupting their Sunday services. Uh, and then another hiccup a day after that. Uh, and then, you know, in the wake of each first episode, and, and Foxy, let me know when you uh, want me to say air spray. Okay, cool. Yeah, just any time. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll finish this paragraph and then I'll say prayers to the Fox real quick before bed. Um, the silence siphoned out of the city and into our ears, spilling from there into our dreams and beliefs, our memories and expectations, in the wake of each fresh episode. So it's going faster, and there's not as many, you know, chunks of prepositions here. There's only one little comma here, right? Um, I wish I should have drawn a picture of every comma in this paragraph. Uh, I wish I had different color highlighters on Adobe, but it's terrible. Uh, anyways, in the wake of each fresh episode, a new feeling flowed through us, full of warmth and lazy equanimity. Another, so then we're moving faster. It took us a while to recognize the feeling for what it was, contentment. Um, so that's a really, really clever build. And that's another way to ramp tension. It's, it's, it's adding significance. When you build into something, that's something that you've built into adds significance. So this is another really cool technique. Um, so we're going to go ahead and put this on page three. Um, starting with long, starting a paragraph with long sentences and making them shorter can, you know, build a sense of tension and meaning within a paragraph, making the final world, the final word, pack an extra punch. I think that's the thing with short stories is there is so much tweaking you have to do to really make that them stick and have a strong effect um, because they are so compressed. So you have to use a lot of tools in your tool belt to make a short story really, really sing. Any questions so far, chat? I know I've been kind of going fast, and I and, and if and if some of these things are not super clear, or if I'm just breezing over the the parts that you're like, wait, 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 what about? that um please let me know uh but yeah but like like we said there's not this is not a perfect story there are probably some areas where it is a little clunky in how they jump between managing this retrospective narrator and these like moments of scene i think that's the one thing i've noticed that has been perfect uh you know uh but there's a lot of really good technique there's a lot of things that that are working you know and i think that's the thing is you have enough stuff that's working really well that it outweighs the things that maybe aren't 100 percent i think yeah that's what that's what it's all about is is just finding those things um all right <sighs> off we go so i'm going to finish this section there we go that's at the bottom of this page and then i'll go see person fox <clears throat> so let me see Oh yeah, contentment. The truth was that we enjoyed the silence, and more than that, we hungered for it. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we forgot ourselves posted. We found ourselves poised in the doorways of our homes in the morning, or in the edges of car seats as we drove to work, trying to hear something very faint beneath the clatter of silence, siren, of sirens and engines. Slowly, we realized that what we were waiting for was another incident to take place. There were weeks when we experienced an episode of silence almost every day. One particular Wednesday, we saw saw three of them in the span of a single hour, but there were other weeks when what the papers took to calling a silence drought de de 
descended upon the city, and our hopes for a cessation went in vain. If more than a few days passed without some minor lull to interrupt the cacophony, we would become irritable and over-tender, quick to na gnash out at one another, and then to rebuke ourselves for our failures. So this is pretty abstract. So this is all summary. And this is where I say, like, it is okay to tell. Um, but look at the way this writer is telling, right? Um, I'm going to try this. Oh, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, but look at, so this is all summary. So they're, they're compressing a few weeks into a short, short, short period of time. Um, but it's, but it's fine. You know, like it's, it's well drawn. It's, it's, and it's very, very concrete, you know, so they're using a lot of specific things. So how do you make somebody work They're using like, you know, the newspapers took to calling it a silent drought. So it's picking moments out of the timeline and like a highlights reel. I think summary when it's when it's when it's un, when it's telling in the wrong way, it is just like you you know um, expressing something we either already know or something that's already clear. Um, but if you are telling in the right way, you know you can compress time. You can do a lot of efficient things with summary. So it's always okay to tell. But just look at how this writer is using the details. If more than a few days pass without some minor, minor lull to interrupt cacophony, we would become irritable and over-tender, quick to gnash out at one another. So he's evoking an emotion. He's evoking very, very specific things. So that's another interesting thing to, to, take, to take away is that you know even in summary, you can be evoking emotion. Even in summary, you can be really specific and, and sharp. Um, it's four, I think. Um, so even when... You know, summary telling is okay, but do it well. You know, use a highlight reel technique or, um, you know, and still work. I'll say try, you don't have to use this thing, you know, but it's a, tr it's a thing to try. Uh, and still work to have emotion evoked through it. All right. The police blotters were nearly empty in the hours following the silence. The drunks in the bars turned amiable and mild. The jails were unusually tranquil. The men who, who ran the cockfights in the warehouses down with the docks said that their birds lost much of their viciousness after the great roar of the city had stopped, becoming as useless as pigeons, virtually impossible to provoke. So then we're starting again with concrete lists. So another way he's doing um, through it, you know, another tool is concrete lists of things events in the city and this is something i think the plural point of view does really well is it gives you this universal perspective that you can just bring all this experience from across an entire people into one place um at, and there was another effect that was just as impressive the doctors at several hospitals reported that their mortality rate showed a pronounced decline after each incident and their recovery rates marked increase. No, the lame did not walk and the blind did not see, but the patients who were on the verge of recuperating from an injury often seemed to turn the corner during an episode, as if the soundlessness had triggered a decision somewhere deep in the cells of their bodies. Surely the most dramatic example was the woman and Mercy General, who came out of a pro prolonged coma in a space of five seconds silence. First her hand moved, then her face opened up behind her eyes, and soon after. So we're zooming in. So now we're into the individual moments. So this is a good transition. So there had been some poor transitions between scene and summary. But this is a really, really smooth one. Um, you know, note, you know, the smooth transition from summary to a, you know, individual moment. Um, first your hands move. So this is like this now it's down to like the play by play of showing, right? First your hands move, then her face opened up behind her eyes, and soon after the noise of the hospital reemerged. She moistened her lips, so very, very tactile, and said, Everything sounded exactly the same to me. The doctors had a hard time convincing her that she was in fact awake. Alright, I'll let you guys start on the next page. 
and I'll be right back.
Alright, I return at last. Sorry about a little bit of the delay, but it's always good to see your prayers. Alright, I'm going to top off my water, and we'll get down to business. Okay. Man, this is a fun story. It's very educational. Alright. <clears throat> Silence proved so beneficial to us that we began to wish it would last forever. We envisioned a city where everyone was healthy and thoughtful, radiant with satisfaction, and the sound of so much as a leaf lighting down on the sidewalk was as rare and as startling as a gunshot. Another, uh, you know, another... Not in love with this little highlighter tunnel tool. So another really nice concrete detail. This little section I'm not as in love with. Um, proof so beneficial. Um, it's kind of restating a little bit of stuff we already know. Um, uh, section eight. Eight. Um, I'm not in complete love with it. So I think also, if I remember correctly, this whole thing is structured in Morse code. Um, the, the the pattern of silences and sounds, um, and it's you know the the Morse code. I'll tell you at the end what it says. Um, <clears throat> But I think this might be an artifice of that, where if you're trying to do a kind of a tricky thing, you sometimes will get paragraphs that don't really need to be there. Uh, and this one is one of them, where we're kind of like, we kind of get it already. You know, like this, this, we already got the vision, we already got this, and it feels like this is verbal doubling a little bit. It's telling us something we already kind of have gathered and or know. So it's something even the pros do, right? Something to watch out for. Even this cat needs to watch out for it. And she's a pro at being fat. She's a fat pro cat. Okay. Off you. Yeah, you go. Sit down nicely. All right. <clears throat> you know, it feels like verbal doubling, repeating a sentiment. All right. <clears throat> Who was the first person to suggest that we try generating? such a silence ourselves, one that would endure until we chose to end it. No one could remember, but the idea took hold with astonishing tenacity. Local magazines published laundry, laund laudatory cover stories on the silence movement. Leaflets with heading like, promote silence, and silence equals life, appeared in our mailboxes. So again, very, very concrete. So whenever they're in summary, whenever this writer is using summary, they are coming at it with very, very concrete examples. Examples, examples. Um, the politicians of both major parties begin to champion the cause. So again, they're just distilling all the stuff from multiple sources of sound. <clears throat> Within its borders, it's not sure. The first step and the most difficult was the dampening of the street traffic. We were encouraged first to all ride the subway trains, which were appointed with the latest noise allevi alleviation. Most of the cars on the left in the road were equipped with silently running electric engines, while the others had their motors fitted with mineral wool shells that allowed them to operate below the threshold of hearing. The roads themselves were surfaced and reinforced open cell foam that absorbed all but the lowest frequency sounds, a material that we also adapted for our use of sidewalks and parking garages. Hello, cat. Hello, kitty. That's my very spoiled cat. That's not part of the story. Once the street traffic was taken care of, we turned our attention to the city's other sources of noise. We sealed the electrical generators behind the thick layers of concrete. We placed tickets. So they're doing all these things. So it's giving all these concrete examples. We redesigned cargo lifts and then the zoos to display to prevent the roars of lions. So he's getting so specific. And I think this is actually like a really interesting thing where... You know, when you're even in a short story, you know, who reads in elevators and cargo lists, so like everything is getting its, 
you know, its mention, you know, saying, oh, we took this technology from from the zoos and we put it into elevators. So I think, you know, when you're doing, this is a speculative concept, you know, this piece shows the benefit of thinking through all the angles. All right. Prey animal, certain noises that weren't essential to the, either the basic operators. And this is another interesting setup. I just noticed this as we turn the page. But, you know, the roars of lions from reaching the exhibits of the prey animal. So there is an antagonism associated with noise. So the examples you use color a lot of the theme. Uh, page five to six, you know, the lion to, you know, roar to prey animals makes, you know, frames the relationships the relationship of noise to your noise to you know danger and you know risk hunting and this comes in later the sense of like this noise versus the danger the risk and the hunting so your noise weren't essential to either the basic operations da, da, da. <clears throat> Fireworks, ringtones. <laughs> we were exultant when the roads fell silent. Please, in the elevator, stop crying out on the cables. But by the time the cell phones appeared, diminishing returns, the greater the number of something more, we noticed the ones that remained. The clock ticking inside a plastic casing, water plunging itself in the toilet tank. So, another very, very sharp, sharp list. One by one, perhaps these sounds were of little account, but added together and made a single vast sonority. No matter how many of them we were able to read, we kept discovering others. We were working to eliminate the noise. Yeah. And this is good. It gives it this goal character. So whenever you, you set up a goal, and this is like the, the goal now is like, we got to have silence. Now that we have the goal, um, you know, this, you know, inexcusable, you know, line is free indirect discourse into the narrator, the we narrator, um, shows that there's a pride and, you know, perfectionism behind this goal. <clears throat> so it's a good, interesting uh, thing. Um, we are more resourceful than we imagined. You know, fun line. Every noise that cropped up, there was one person in the city who had prepared to counteract it. An engineer. So now we've gone from the country to the city. You know, uh, I don't know exactly how this frames in, but we've zoomed in a little bit, I think. You know, on page six, you know, we've zoomed in narrowing the we down to a smaller group. I mean, it's always kind of been a city, but there have been times where, like, the national government will be like, oh, we need to da 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 da, -da reduce the sound. So interesting. By the medical helicopter, the, the beat that beat by his office at seven times a day drew up plans for a special kind of rotor blade in Canada. He did the plans for the hospital. These are all the different, you know, noise examples. No, no, thank you, young lady. That's not how you get what you want. You don't go pawing at somebody. Um. <clears throat> I like to sit on the floor watching now that she pressed the button again and love again. Oh. Cat? No, you need to go over there. You're being a stink. Okay, sitting quietly, you can get what you want. Okay, come on. Okay, maybe I'll just pet you. I don't know what you want, cat. You're being you're being weird. All right. <clears throat> 
copper design a nail gun that would soak up the noise of its own thud. Da, 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 eventually, okay. So that by by making by making his initial innovations, you know, and this is kind of like the thing with fantasy and science fiction, you know, by making his initial inventions, you know, really well reasoned out, you know. set up as plausible the more you know off the wall innovations he's bringing in you know we don't question you know he spends a whole lot of time talking about how to make cars and you put wool around the engine and do all this stuff and then you know he's like a nail gun that can soak up its own sound you're like how is that possible that would be literally impossible but you know he's set that up in those previous things, you just kind of gloss over because you're saying, I believe that they can do this. I believe that this can happen. All right. Snuffy Nose Final Boss is the hour teaser. Um, fun. School teacher, frictionless pencil. Yeah, so there's there's all these things that's just like they're using lists. Uh, this writer is using lists really effectively. Every, <sighs> every noise, but then muffled sigh. Every time the silence was close to perfect, whole minutes went by after the early morning reached the sky. We came to know ourselves better than we had before. Took up chess or poker, began a new course of exercise. A great many couples made their marriage vows, and not a few others filed for divorce. One boy, an eight-year-old, who attended the Holy Soul. So then, we're always, whenever he's using lists, we're zooming in, right? So he's having lists build to a big moment. <clears throat> so like lists of events can build into a scene. So he has a few. We can even count them here. So like um. You know, um, using lists of events um, to eventually build into a longer scene, you know. Because um, we have, okay, so we have the summary, we have, okay, greater stillness. It was easier for us to see the shapes we wish our lives to take. Okay, great meaning couples, that are okay. Yeah, people changed their jobs, took up chess or poker, concrete, concrete, began new courses of exercise. A great many couples made their marriage vows, and not a few others filed for divorce. One boy, and now we're zooming in really tight. So it goes like people, a great many, one. You know, uh, you know, people, <laughs> and then it goes to a great many, to one cat. If you mess with that couch. You're going to be in a world of spray to one boy. And then we go into that story. One boy, an eight-year-old who attended the Holy Souls Patriarchal Academy, left school as the rest of his class was walking to the lunchroom, rode the subway to the Natural History Museum, and found his way to the dinosaur exhibit. He waited until the room had emptied and then stole beneath the tennis Tyrannosaurus, using the giant ribs of the skeleton to climb up to the skull. He was found there late that evening by a security guard sitting hungry but uninjured on the smoothly curving floor of the jaw the boy had left a note in his teacher's paper tray explaining himself he had dreamed the dinosaur was still roaring the note said but so weakly that the sound could only be heard from directly inside his head he wanted to find out if it was true oh what did i walk into how's it going we are doing a different style uh, so normally this is an editing and or writing uh stream um but a few people because of the uh, fact that so many people are stuck at home today, a few people requested that we do a stream that was more around analyzing an existing piece of fiction and talking about it. So what we're doing is this is a, a really great story. This is called The Year of Silence. You can find it on our Discord. Um, in the fantasy world, nice. Welcome 667. Welcome Cat Cat 7. Um, my cat is meowing down here. Um, 
But yeah, so that's what we're doing, and uh, we're kind of breaking down this really clever story told in a plural point of view, a very rare and uncommonly used point of view, but also using some really great techniques that apply to all stories. Um, so then we launch forward. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy if you are a writer or a storyteller to to just talk about some craft questions or anything you might have. You know, one of the uh, the you know, try to make the having to sit around and deal with this, uh, you know, being inside a little bit more palatable for everyone. Yes, cat. You want to come up? Okay, come up. But no more being a hot mess. Ow. Okay. <laughs> we can't keep our claws in our in our hands. Doing a different type of writing tonight. Computer programs. Nice. Very nice. Well, hopefully this is some nice. Uh, while you all, you know, uh, while you all are, you know, uh, making sure not to cough on people and things. Oh, there's a nice little break. The boy who climbed the train of stories. We're still in that, even as we change a section, this is the first time a character has jumped sections. Uh, and this is kind of showing that we're getting to the middle, and this is exactly what's happening. So it's went from a very general thing to a very, very specific character. Um, the boy who climbed the Tyrannosaurus Rex was not the first of us to feel that his dreams were blending together with his reality. There was something about the luxuriousness of our situation that made it tempting to imagine that the space outside our heads was conforming to the space inside. Yet we did not really believe that this was so. It was just that we were seeing everything with a greater clarity, both our minds and our surroundings, and the clarity had become more important to us than the division. Uh, it's a little... I mean, so in terms of, like, critiquing... You know, because uh, there are mistakes that published writers also make. Um, <clears throat> this is a little kind of too, I think, it zooms too far out. And the clarity have become more important than division. So they get interesting, a little clunky, I would say. I don't think some of these, uh, like, very, very zoomed out things are as helpful. So I don't think this is working as well for the writer. I do think his use of detail is fantastic. Um, but these types of things where he's kind of jumping, when he's pulling back to the very, very abstract, it just doesn't seem to flow as well. So that's another thing. It's just like, hey, it's tough. It's always difficult, you know, to zoom out into, into very abstract concepts from a story that's been in the concrete a story that's been in the concrete um you know these transitions are the you know make or break so going from like thoughts abstract concepts to concrete things happening like a boy climbing in a t-rex um that transition is a very tough one to make uh and i think a few times we've 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 noticed or at least talked about that hey like jumping between this really really vivid concrete imagery and the summary has been a little jarring and then again in the more conceptual realm of between events and the ideas that we extract from those events those transitions are always hard in all writing it seems like this is a little bit uh clunkier here this reads like Itachi style. That's great. So this is a very um, this might be a helpful one for him to read. Hold on one second. Yeah, this might be a helpful story for him to read. Uh, and this is using a a distant uh, a, a plural third person narrator. Sorry, plural first person. Um, misspoke there. All right. The silence was plain and rich and deep. It seemed. In Infinitely delicate, yet strangely irresistible, as though any one of us could have broken it with a single word if we had not been so enraptured. Every so often, another natural episode would take place, and for a few seconds the character of the silence would change slightly. The brightness of a room might alter some distant roller in the current singed through a light bulb, but the quiet we had generated was so encompassing by now that only the most sensitive among us could be sure that something had truly happened. The abundant sounds we proceeded into ourselves. We fell asleep each night, woke each morning, and went about with our routines. Each day, doing the shopping, preparing our tax returns, and making love, and cooking dinner, filing papers, and cutting our palms. So there's, and yeah, so like you know, this is the whole thing, you know, preparing our tax returns 
and making love and cooking dinner. Uh, another very interesting juxtaposition. So whenever you're going to be using a lot of concrete lists, the the, the items that you juxtapose um, mean something. So when the writer is juxtaposing, preparing your tax returns and making love and cooking and, and all these things and filing papers, it, it it's making the highs and the lows of life normalized, right? It's it's saying, okay, everything's become this just like balanced state. These extremes, you know, you can't think of anything much more extreme than making love and filing tax returns. But juxtaposing them together means that like in this silent world, all these things have joined together and become a single kind of line. Um, a, a you know, a, a line of clarity, a line of thing, but like without these swings. So this is beginning to expose a problem, and eventually we'll see in the rest of the story that this problem resolves eventually with the, the, the you know, um, a different resolution. I don't want to spoil it too much, but this does, you know, uh, the things you just oppose, you know, when using concrete details. Summary list. Um, the things you juxtapose can add on text to it. I.e., you know, we went about our routines, you know, filing tax returns, skydiving, you know. You know, ninja fighting, you know, <laughs> that's a bad example, you know, uh, but just to make that point. All right. <clears throat> Everywhere we can see the signs of life in fluctuation. We're over here. Whoops. Librarian. So again, we're back to another very specific example. Who had worked in periodicals, in the periodicals room for almost three decades, began displaying her oil paintings in an art gallery. Hundreds of them, all on lending slips she had sal salvaged from the library's in-and-out tray. Each tiny piece of paper flexed with the weight of the paint that had hardened into it. The flyers at the gallery door proclaimed the woman had never had the nerve to show her work before the silence was established. The bursar at the university was caught skimming money from the school's pension fund. In her letter of resignation, she said that she was ashamed only that she had been found out. If there was one thing the silence had taught her, she wrote, it was that any grief which befell a professor emeritus could never be more than a fraction of what she deserved. A visiting gymnast giving an exhibition from the pommel on the pommel horse at the Midtown Sports Club, fractured his wrist while doing a routine. But up until that moment of the accident, he reported the audience in the city was most respectful he had ever seen, barely a cough or a rustle among them. Gradually, as we knew, as we grew used to this, so, like, this is, like, the whole, you know, this is giving a sense of, like, the, the status quo is really, really changing. Uh, and it's changing not necessarily for the better. Uh, and as we go on, we'll see. What happens next? Gradually, as we grew used to the stillness, the episodes of spontaneous and absolute silence came less frequently. There might be a three-second burst one week, followed by a one-second flicker a few weeks later. And if the episodes were running exceptionally heavy, another one-second echo a week or two after that. One of the physicists at the city's Lakes and Streams Commission came up with what he called a skipping rock model to describe the pattern. The distribution of silence, as he suggested, was like that of a rock skipping over water, and then, if one could imagine a thing, doubling back and returning to shore. At first, such a rock would land only rarely, but as it continued as its path, it would strike down more and more rapidly until eventually the water would seize it and it would sink. But then, according to the paradigm, the rock would be ejected spontaneously through the surface to repeat its journey in reverse, hitting the water with increasing rarity until it landed back in the hand of the man who had thrown it. The physicists could not explain why the silence had adopted this behavior, or who, if anyone, had thrown it. He could only observe that it had. Some eight months after the first incident took place, it had been so long since anyone had noticed one of the episodes that it seemed safe to presume they were finished. The city was facing an early winter. Every afternoon, a snow of soft, fat flakes would drift gently down from the sky, covering the trees and pavilions, the mailboxes, the, and the parking meters. So again, very, very heavy use of lists by this writer to create quick scenes. And this is something to think about 
when you are either in an, in a more narrative mode when you're when you're not in scene and active you know what's happening moment by moment um another really interesting takeaway here is is to say okay you know the 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 short stories you know what we're so used to because we read novels is scene is is a very heavy leaning on scene but you know one thing that is really interesting and in, in short stories that's not necessarily how it always has to be you can do a lot more with summary you can you know tell a whole story in summary and these are some of the techniques that you have and when you're in a novel and you do need to cut and you need to do some telling these are the techniques that you have at your disposal you know using lists using lists with concrete details juxtaposing those details um, and giving that evocative scene with just a few quick sentences I mean we get a city in winter in just a couple of so you know city was facing an early winter every afternoon a snow of soft, fat flakes would drift gently down from the sky, covering the trees and the pavilions, the mailboxes and the parking meters, the streets and the sidewalks. That's perfect. So it zooms really tight on the detail of the snow and then shows where it's going to be. And it gives us the immediate impression in one sentence of a very well-evoked scene. And I think that's the thing that a lot of beginning writers don't always realize is that, you know, you can establishes a really really vivid scene in a sentence with a few thought out details um, you know using a list of details can a vivid scene of, you know with minimal you know uh, required, you know, uh, length requirements. I think that's the thing for whether you're a novel writer or you're a short story writer or anything. It's just say, hey, how can I communicate as much as possible with as little as possible? I think that's something that every writer should be pretty, pretty regularly thinking about and pretty regularly scratching their heads over. Uh, and so this is a great technique that is used here. All right. <clears throat> I was going to try to read another screenplay, but I just don't know if I'll have time. I'm still going through this and um, getting pretty sleepy. Uh, anyways, some eight months after the first incident took place, it had been so long since anyone had noticed one of the episodes. Oh, yeah, okay. The sound of our footsteps crackling over the fresh accumulation was like a horde of crickets scraping their wings together in an empty room. Another really, really great detail. Um... And that's another thing. When you're going to use simile and metaphor, give me something I've not heard before. I've never heard like a horde of crickets breaking their wings together in an empty room. Um, you know, like you'll see the crickets in summer or the crickets in blah. Empty room is a new way. So when you are going to use detail, you know, when you are going to use, you know, detail and metaphor or use metaphor or simile, you know, imagery, um, give us a, you know, comparison or image we haven't seen before. Don't rely on the same, on the same tried images. Um, <clears throat> all right. You know, you know, a horde of crickets you know So I'm going to add some of these as writing tips um, just to make sure that we still get those new tips in because I haven't had new writing tips in a while. Um, <clears throat> um, how's everybody doing in chat? 
I know a lot of y'all are working and lurking and doing other things. But yeah, let me know if you ever had any questions. I know we've been going through this pretty quick. But uh, yeah. Or if you like this format. Um, and you can talk about it in Discord too if you say, hey, I've been, I really liked, this was very helpful, um, you know, having an edit on a published, um, well-acknowledged, well-renowned story versus um, kind of the normal stuff that we do, which is maybe more, you know, writers who are learning. Now, not until we walk through the snow do we really discover how custom... We might have been content to go on as we were forever, whole generations of being born into a noiseless world, learning to crawl and stand and tie our shoes, growing up and then apart, setting our past aside and then our futures, and finally dying and becoming as quiet as our minds. So this is interesting. So like this, this is really showing a problem. And I think this is the thing. So we've we've got so many descriptions of silence, um, but this is becoming quite a grim picture. Learning to grow up and die and live silently. So, and you can see with the way that the thing is described, the impression is given. And this is a very tough thing to do. Um, and it sounds easy, but it's it's not. Um, you know, the way something is described by you know the narrator or otherwise gives the quality of its nature and even the you know emotion you know even can communicate irony so like this is a very ironic um, turn of phrase you know we might have been content to go on as we were forever, whole generations us, being born into a noiseless world, learning to crawl and to stand in tire shoes, growing up and then apart. So it's saying that the silence is separating people, setting our pasts aside and then our future. So they're just slowly becoming nothing. The silence of death is already getting to them early. And finally dying and becoming as quiet in our minds as we had been in our bodies, had it not been another, for another event that came to pass. Another very long sentence. Let's say one sentence paragraph. So this is really stretching it out. It's trying to like encompass an entire life cycle into that sentence. So another thing is just really looking at how this writer is just varying sentence length and really not being afraid to tackle a complex and long sentence construction when it's serving the purpose of the story. It was shortly after 9 a.m. on a Tuesday. So we're getting this repetition of the event structure here. So, you know, um, we're repeating the, you know, news event date time structure to show that a momentous change is incoming. When a few seconds of sound overtook the city, there was a short circuit in the system of sonic filters we had installed in our buildings, and for a moment the walks were transparent to every noise. The engine of a garbage truck backfired, a cat began to yowl, a rotten limb dropped from a tree and scattered so like Another just rapid fire of sound details. This is the exact same construction as the sentence above. Exact same construction as the first sentence. So we're establishing a new paradigm. A lot of mirroring, a lot of prose techniques are being used here. Um, this sentence, you know, with the concrete, you know, so you this exact construction is the first sentence of the story, right? It was shortly after 9 a.m. It has the date, what, how, like, you know, it has that news event feeling. When a few, and then it has the summary. So a few seconds of sound overtook the summary. So, like, it's like, okay, it just tells you what happened. A few seconds of sound overtook the summary, the city. Then it zooms in. There was a short circuit in the system of sonic filters. And for a moment. So it kind of gives an explanation, and then it just, like, jumps into this list. The walls were transparent to every noise. The engine of a garbage truck backfired. A cat began to yell. Da, 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 da. Ten thousand people suddenly struck their knees in the corner of a desk or remembered a loss they had forgotten or slid into an orgasm beneath the bodies of their lovers and cried out in grief or pain. So it's like, rah, this roar of life. 
and the period of noise was abrupt and explosive, cleanly defined at both of his borders. Instinctively, we find ourselves twisting around. Okay, so I'm going to jump back to the beginning because I feel like it would be instructive even though it's kind of far. So this is what, um, page 5 of 7? Okay. Let's look at the initial construction. Shortly after 2 in the afternoon, on Monday the 6th of April. So then we have the time. A few seconds of silence overtook the city. A little brief summary. The rattle of jackhammers and then, boom, it launches into the list. So this mirrored construction is making the read so like so we had this construction set up this enormous payoff so because the writer is using that same mirrored construction later we get the feeling that the payoff is going to be just as enormous and it does some of the work for the writer i believe so then we're like oh this is going to be this like you know this is a, a similar size of event you know a similar level of life changing is going to happen in the story for these for these wee characters instinctively we found ourselves twisting around to look for its source and the situation corrected itself and just like that we were reabsorbed in silence seeing the city had been opened like a tin can so much time had gone since we'd heard our lives in their full commotion that we barely recognized the sound for what it was the ground might have fallen in the world might have ended Four days later, another such incident occurred. This one almost eight seconds long. It was followed by the next week by a considerably shorter episode, as brief as coal popping in a fire, which itself was followed a few days later by a fourth episode, and immediately after by a fifth and sixth. Early in the next afternoon by a seventh. We were at a loss for the, to account for the phenomenon. A cryptographer employed by the police force announced a belief that both episodes of silence and episodes of clamor resembled communications taking the form of Morse code. Though from whom or what he could not say, a higher intelligence, the city itself, any answer he might have made would have been no more than speculation. His hunch was that the sender, whoever it was, had resorted to using noise because we had ceased to take note of the silence. He said that he was keeping a record of the dots and dashes and hoped to be able to decipher the message very soon. The cryptographer's theory bore all the earmarks of lunacy, and few of us pretended to accept of it. But at least, so then we're, you know, so then we're kind of talking on behalf of the body of people. This is the, the really handy part of the we, is like, if you're talking about this momentous kind of society, you know, where is it? But it was, at least. And few of us pretended to, to accept it. Yeah. <clears throat> We would stop whatever we were doing, our arms and our shoulders braced of some okay, to wonder what was going on. Many of us began to look forward to these eruptions of sound. We dreamed about them at night. We awaited them with a feeling of great thirst. The head of the city's notary public department, for instance, missed the noise of the Newton's cradle he kept in his office, the hanging middle balls clicking tick attack tack against each other as they swayed back and forth. The cab driver who began to circuit outside the central subway wished that he was still able to punch his horn in the couriers whose bicycles skimmed so close to the bumper. The woman who ran the Christian gift store in a shopping mall designed a greeting card. So there's so much very, very specific detail. And I think this is the way to do summary. And this is a <clears throat> this is a lesson in telling. This is if you want to tell in your story, and I think it's totally fine, um, this is how to do it. Um, using these very, very concrete details and sentences. The made Ubin who ran a Christian gifts were designed a greeting card with illustration of a tree of kittens playing cymbals, bagpipes, and a tube in the front of the inscription read, Make a joyful noise to the Lord. She printed a hundred copies in the stock by the cash register along with twenty three more to mail to the members of her Sunday school class. <clears throat> Turned out that in spite of everything the silence had brought us, there was a hidden longing for sound in the city. Again, it's a little clunky, and we're already kinda getting this. I think this this is where we could probably have shown. And I think this writer is, is, is relying and he's so good at showing that he is relying a little bit or it's on telling he's relying a little bit too much on it. There's times where you're like, oh, this would probably be we can get that. You know, that we're getting told a little bit too much. Like we're we're getting this with the Sunday school thing. And I think this is um Probably one of the things I think that this writer has struggled with, and that isn't perfect in this story, is the transitions. You know, saying, okay, what to tell, 
when to tell, when can we show it, and, and how does that transition always go? Um, so yeah, I would say um, uh, transition into telling feels a little too clunky here. The people who went to the club did so for pure excitement of it, for the way the din set their hearts to beating. So a lot of great words for sound. Again, great word choice. This guy's thought about a lot of these 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 sounds that he wants his story to make. Who needed serenity? They wanted to know. Whoever asked for it. They stood in groups, listening to the club switchboard operator laying sound upon sound in the small enclosed space of the room. The slanting note of a violin, the pulse of an ambulance silent, gallons of water, gallon, yeah. So then we have these just like very visceral descriptions of sound. Uh, and they're all fragments. And this is another thing to note is like this this writer is is now transitioning from these long languid sentences as we're getting into the sound world again to like fragments this is punching you in the face this is really really driving the story aggressively and so this is another thing that that is a very helpful tool and something to study is and and, and it's one of those things that when you study it you don't always you don't have to like Go and do it exactly in your writing, but as you study it and as you just internalize these concepts, you'll find that they start to appear in your writing, whether you're intending them to or not. Because you'll be like, oh, I kind of want to make it feel jumpy. You know, maybe I'll use fragments. Um, <clears throat> these, you know, commotion sounds, you know, makes makes the, you know beat, you know, the the noise of the story much more disruptive. Afterward, the close patients are literally on their pillows, unable to fall asleep, their minds spinning with joy and exhilaration. Um, so I think, like, you read this amazing bit of, sh like, show-telling, you know, like, where it's, like, it's still summary, but it's done it in a way that it feels like you're there, and you think you just don't need this. I, I, you know, I think that's, there's a little bit of too much explanation going on sometimes in this story. Um, the episodes continued in the spring, falling over the city at intervals none of us could predict. Whatever became most used to the sounds, it seemed the fundamental turmoil of the world would break again through the tranquility and present itself to us again. More and more people began to prefer these times of disruption. They made us feel like athletes facing a game, like soldiers who had finished their training, capable of accomplishing great things in a battle. A consensus slowly gathered among us. We had given up something important. We believed the fire, the vigor that came with lack of ease. We had lost some difficulty of our lives. We wanted it back. The city council drafted a measure to abolish the silence initiative. After a preliminary period of debate and consideration was adopted by common consent. The work of breaking the city's silence was not nearly as painstaking as the work of establishing it. With a flip of a few switches and the snip of a few wires, the sonic filters that had sheltered our buildings were disabled, opening our walls to every bird call and thunderclap. Scrapers and bulldozers tore up the road. I mean, just like the very, very sharp scrape bulldozer tore. So then, even like the word choice in the sentence is coming with very, very sharp kind of staccato things that, that are pretty, uh, you know, um, aggressive. So this is using word sound to underlying... <clears throat> underlying to like to make the underlying message go smoothly right a cloth was unwound from the clappers and the church bells the old city buses were rolled out of the warehouse the fireworks stand was erected by the docks a man in a black suit carried an or orange crate in the park and one evening he preached about the dangers of premarital sex a man with a tattoo of an ear drop on his cheek set three crisply folded playing cards on a table and began to shuffling them in intersecting circles calling out to the people who walked by that he would offer two dollars Two clean, new, green, new, new George Washington dollar bills to anyone who could find that lovely lady, the lady in red, the beautiful queen of hearts. Um, so again, we're zooming in to like this specific moment. Um, so another, this is another zoom in moment, right? So we're like, we're starting with like pretty abstract example scrapers and tore up the roads. Like this is pretty concrete and it's zooming in down to like an actual person and dialogue, right? Um, and so this is like reported dialogue here. So like, you know, again, we, we have this, this, this funnel in where we start with a 
a few abstract concepts, you know, oh, you know, there's a flip of a switch, there's a thunderclap, scrapers and bulldozers tore up the road, the cloth was unround, you know, there's a man talking, you know, the man in the black suit talked about the preaches about the dangers of premarital sex. Okay. That's a more specific example. So that starts zooming us in a little closer and then it gets in. So this is a well done transition. This is a very well done transition. And then it gets into the long sentence, the detail. A man with a tattoo of a teardrop, so precise, on his cheek set three crisply folded playing cards on a table and began shuffling them in intersecting circles, calling out to the people who walked by that he would offer two dollars to clean new green new to clean new green new i didn't even read that the first time so there's like this rhyme there's this rhythm there's this dialogue that's coming out offer two dollars to clean new green new george washington dollar bills to anyone who could find that lovely lady that lady in red the beautiful queen of hearts um so that is a very very clever transition and what we're doing is we're starting from it's it gives everything else life. It shows this life transition. So you give short list items, you expand them out a little bit more, and then you end with a bang with this like really, really well wrought imagery. And I think that's a really clever way to, to, to summarize and to say, okay, the whole city is, I mean, this is one paragraph and this is the whole city transforming. This is months of work and it's using those details and juxtaposing them and expanding them out to really evoke the um, the final kind of finish there. In a matter of weeks, we could hear cell phones ringing in restaurants again, basketballs slapping the pavement, you know, just like plosive sounds, slapping, you know, so using those plosive words, cell phones ringing in the restaurants, basketballs slapping the pavement, car stereos pouring, so he's using a lot of, so that's a, uh, it's, a, it's a less used technique, and it's something you don't have to think about too much if you're learning as a writer. But the sounds of the verbs and the sounds of I mean, all the words sounds matter, but the verbs are the things that really, really sometimes carry a sentence. And so using, you know, slapping the pavement. Is it going to do that? Stereo is pouring, you know, so, and it's kind of, you know, escalating too. I mean, everywhere in the air we felt the pleasure. A pleasurable sense of agitation and for interactions with each other no longer seem to still the depths of the secluded pools we became more headstrong let's like the water while the noise offered compensation we became more headstrong more passionate our sentimental our sentiments were close to the surface our lives seemed no less purposeful than they had during the silence but it was as if that purpose were waiting several corners away from us now rather than hovering in front of our eyes for a while, the outbreaks of sound continued to make themselves heard over the noise of the city, just as the outbreaks of the silence had, but soon it became hard to distinguish them from the ongoing rumble of the traffic. And so we're moving faster so through this episode. So the silence episode took about half the story. And this is actually like a really interesting structure, right? Um... <clears throat> because it follows like a like a like a screenplay structure, you know, the the kind of the silence structure took us to the midpoint. At the midpoint, there was a turn, which was we began to realize that the silence wasn't what we wanted it to be anymore. Um, there was kind of this souring of the silence and this kind of section of the story where the the writer was portraying the silence in kind of a less positive light. It was like, hey, you're just kind of living out death uh, in life, and then in this last kind of third to a quarter. Um, then it's the onslaught of, 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 um, sound coming in and coming back in and it moves much faster and it gives that increase in pacing. So we've had, with silence took half a story. The return of sound takes only a quarter. It only takes a few pages when silence took maybe half, over half the story, um, to get established. For a while, the outbreaks of sound continued to make themselves heard over the noise of the city, just as the outbreaks of silence had, but soon it became harder to distinguish them from the ongoing rumble of traffic. There were a few quick flashes of noise during the last week of May, but if they carried on into the summer, we failed to notice them. And there were places where dogs tipping over garbage cans, flatbed trucks beeping, you know, like, the, he's, be, he's using tipping, beeping, you know, these are like the sharp plosive sounds that are 
that are going to make this noise feel visceral when you read it. As they backed out of alleys and fountains sip, spilling, spilling into themselves again. So he's using all these plosive sounds. Every one of these verbs has a plosive sound. As they backed out and B is another really strong beeping. I forget the name of the B one. I think it's just like there's some sort of there's some sort of name for it. I forget the name of the B sound. I just know P is plosive. But yeah, but he's using a lot of these things. No sibilants, no S's, no s whispering. You know, this is big punchy sounds. And this is how you know to communicate something like noise when you're when you're on paper, right? Like and, and you know you can communicate a lot of other stuff to have like plosives come with this grating feeling, you know. Um, so if you want to have a, a conversation between characters feel more grating or any of those other techniques, these are the tools to reach for first. I guarantee that. The quiet that sometimes fell over us in movie theaters began to seem as deep as any we'd ever known. We had a vague inkling that we had once experienced our minds with greater intimacy, but we could not quite recover the way it had felt. So then there's this trade-off, you know. So then I think I think this is the interesting thing. So we have that that similar structure of sound in miniature, right? So you have or the silence in miniature. So you had this whole portion of the story that was uh, learning the benefits of silence, establishing the benefits of silence, and then there was a turn when the silence soured a little bit. And now we've had that same thing where we've had this shorter, you know, moment of this encroachment of sound again, and then we had a little bit of how that's starting to sour, how we're starting to lose a little bit of the, the quietude of our souls. Every day, the silence that engulfed the city receded further into the past. It was plain that in time we'd forget it had ever happened that year had gone by we leave only and, and this shows also just like the powerlessness you know of people between their passions and their things you know the we character never had a choice he and this is a, another risky thing to make the we character was just reactive you know these things were happening they would go and they did do some proactive things they, you know they would make the city silent and they made the city unsilent again um but it's an interesting thing, you know, that 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 they were just a dog following a bone in so many ways throughout the story. That's an interesting thematic element that I think is is a cool one. Every day the silence that engulfed the city receded further into the past. It was plain that in time we'd forget it had ever happened. The year that had gone by would leave only a few scattered signs behind, like the imprints of vanished shells in the crust of a dried lake bed. Just fossils. But again, like instead of saying like fossils, you know, look at how this writer is doing it. You know, the easy simile is to be like fossils. And I think that's the challenge. I think if you're going to use imagery in your writing, you want to be really thoughtful about it and to come up with an image and a comparison we haven't seen before. Because if you're going to just use a tried you know, image that we've already seen, a cliched image, just go ahead and describe what's what and move on and save us the 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 the, the time. But you know, this makes us look at it in a different way. Um, and you kind of feel the death of it, because a fossil does you know, imprints of vanished cells. That means that like the shell died and vanished and it's all that's left is this imprint. And by breaking that image of fossils apart it shows us the elements that we want to take away, which is like there's this actual sense of loss. There's this vanished thing, which was the silence. That, that is, that's all we're going to have of it now. The exemplary hash of our elevators, the tangles, tangles of useless wire in our walls, and the advanced design of our subway lines fading slowly into antiquation. That in a short item published in the Thursday, July the 8th edition. So again, he's signaling to us, third time, rule of threes, right? He's signaling to us, this is really important. Thursday, July the 8th, edition of the morning paper. So again, very end of the story, bringing this, this date, time thing, saying Thursday, July the 8th, edition of the morning newspaper. He always is doing time of day, too. A letter detailing the results of the log of the police department's cryptographer had been keeping a repeating series of dots and dashes whose meaning was explicit, he said, but whose import he could not fathom. Dot dash, dot dot, dot dot, dot dot, dash, dot dash, dot dot. 
and what that Morse code reads. Uh, if you translate it is, listen well. <laughs> so that's a fun one. Listen well. A year of silence broken down by the final boss. There are some wonderful techniques that this writer is using uh, with their plural point of view, using narrative summary, using telling. You know, all these people tell you you cannot tell in stories. You can tell in stories. You just have to be better at it. You know, I think um, showing is easier to learn. It's easier to learn how to write scenes. It's much harder to learn how to um, write summary, I think. And so studying stories like this can really help you get there. Um, any other questions from chat before I go ahead and sign off? Uh, send them now. Um, if not, no worries. Uh, and yeah, this has been a fun story. I hope you all are staying safe and at home and, you know, um, virus free. And yeah, I hope this little different, different style of content was helpful for you guys. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learn from it. I hope it helps improve your writing and um, keeps you from getting too bored as you sequester yourself at home uh, during this virus thing. Um, nope, not staying safe. Well, you know, at least wear a mask while you're jumping, bungee jumping. Um, but uh, but yeah, another word, in another world, writing conflict between lovers. <laughs> that is as dangerous as it gets writing those conflict uh yeah staying out of those lover spats at least with literature you can close the book um you know that's the uh, that's the powerful thing about it uh but yeah anybody uh anyways everybody take care thanks for hanging out um give us a follow if you liked this video and um let me know on discord if you want to see more of this style of video if our normal edits are more what you're looking for um or if this is helpful or if just me doing the traditional or the the more standard just me writing my stuff and answering questions while i write so i hope this was fun i hope this was a nice break from the kind of um sequestering at home that a lot of you are having to do and i hope this kind of lightens your day a little bit um and uh, stay healthy everybody stay safe and um you know wash your hands regularly <laughs> have a great night